again and happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room and of course all those joining us online, whether you are a natural dad or a spiritual dad or a granddad or a wannabe dad or a plan to be dad or a foster dad, whatever form of dad you are, we really hope that you're having a great day already and trust that you are going to feel appreciated and celebrated today. And of course, the fact that it is Father's Day means that we like to take the opportunity to just acknowledge not only the wonderful gift that fatherhood is, but also the significant challenge that fatherhood can be. I know for many of the dads that I know, fatherhood is a deeply rewarding and enjoyable experience with like the occasional challenge. But for many other dads, it's the opposite way around. Like fatherhood is just one big challenge for various reasons with only the occasional moment of kind of joy and happiness. And so if that's you today, we want you to know that we are thinking of you today. We have already been praying for you and we're trusting that today you're going to just sense God's presence and his validation and his love over your life. And if today's a hard day for you for whatever reason, either because of your experience as a father or because of your experience with your father, then we hope that today you feel God's love and His presence around your life and that you know that you have a loving Heavenly Father who is all that we ever desired our fathers to be and who is all that we aspire to be as fathers. And we trust that above all you experience His love today. Now, of course, as you well know, our slogan here at The Rocks is no perfect people allowed. And I absolutely love that. Because it's a constant reminder to me that I am still a work in progress, right? My life is still under construction and so is yours. And so I am not yet what I am destined to be. And I am not yet what I have the potential to be, but I'm also not what I used to be. I have grown, I have changed, I've matured, I've improved, right? And hopefully through all that process, I've become more like Jesus because that is God's goal for all of our lives. And that is true of you as well. And I certainly find that encouraging as a father because I think sometimes as dads, we really do want to do the best we possibly can. We want to be the best kind of father we can, but we don't always live up to the level of our aspiration or our expectation. And so sometimes we feel, you know, self-doubt and self-disappointment. But I'm encouraged by the fact that I am still in process, right? I'm only half-baked. God is not finished with me yet. He's still working on me and He's still working on you. And so there's opportunity to learn and grow. And because our lives are still, in a sense, under construction, and because you and I are still a work in progress, The fact of the matter is there is an unfinished quality to our lives. There's something about our lives that are just characterized by this unfinished nature. And I want to speak about the unfinished nature of life today. And usually there are kind of two sides to this dynamic. The first is what I would call unfinished business, right? The unfinished business of our lives. And by unfinished business, I mean the things that we ought to do or need to do that only we can do, that are yet to be done. Unfinished business refers to all those things in our lives that we need to do, that only we can do, that are yet to be done. And we all have unfinished business like that. And usually that type of unfinished business comes to us in one of three forms. And the first is what I call unfulfilled commitments. Sometimes unfinished business shows up in your life in the form of unfulfilled commitments commitments. And by that, I mean the commitments that we make, commitments that we make on our own initiative as a result of our volitional capacity, our ability to choose and decide. Sometimes we make commitments that for whatever reason, we just have not yet followed through on. So these types of commitments could be uh, promises that you have made that you have not yet kept, or maybe people that you committed to reaching out to that for whatever reason, you just have not yet made contact with. Or maybe payments that you were supposed to make that you haven't yet made. Or maybe projects that you started that are not yet finished. I don't know about you, but we've got heaps of projects going on at home. In fact, we have some projects that have been going on for months and some projects that have been going on for years. And uh, I'm constantly reminded about the unfinished nature of those projects. Like our garden, for example. Like My wife and I are not great gardeners, right? Um, so, so we don't have green thumbs. We're not out in the garden a lot. And consequently, our garden is in desperate need of some love and attention. So um, it's not that we don't like gardens, right? We love gardens. We, we love beautiful gardens. We just don't want to have to plant them, water them, feed them, <laughs> weed them, and maintain them. We want them to just spontaneously appear and maintain themselves. 
And so uh, this year, we decided we're going to make some progress on our garden. And so we had some garden edging put in, like not that kind of cheap stuff you buy from Bunnings, like some really nice kind of concrete laid edging to keep the lawn out of the beds. But the beds are still barren, like there were no plants in the beds. And so, uh, so every time I pull up into the driveway, like I am reminded of the unfinished nature of that commitment to get our garden done. And of course, every now and again, my wife will remind me of the unfinished nature of the garden. And can I just say, ladies, when, when a man says he's going to do something, he will do it. You do not have to remind him every six months about it, okay? So, uh, so that is the nature of unfinished business. And, and sometimes those unfulfilled commitments can be like a stone in your shoe, it's kind of like a, like a splinter in your mind, right? To quote Morpheus from The Matrix. It, it just kind of sits in the back of your thinking and it gnaws away at your peace of mind. It gets under your skin and it agitates you and it annoys you because you know this thing needs to be done and it hasn't yet been done. And in fact, not only does it weigh on your mental health and your emotional well-being, it actually puts strain on your relationships too. Because very often there are people on the other side of those unfulfilled commitments who are counting on you to come through. And so when you don't, it puts significant pressure on them. And so it can be quite straining on the relationships. Of course, the opposite is true. When you follow through on those unfulfilled commitments, there's an instant sense of release and relief. You feel a lightness in your spirit and in your mind. And so it's a good thing to do. And that's why I like this encouragement from Paul the Apostle who of course was a spiritual dad, like he wasn't a natural dad, but he was a spiritual dad. And in fact, he said to the Corinthian believers, hey, you got many teachers, but you don't have a lot of fathers. And I've become like a father to you in the faith. And so he writes to these Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 10 to 11, and listen to his fatherly advice. He says, here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first to propose this idea and the first to begin doing something about it. Having started so enthusiastically, you should now complete this project with equal enthusiasm by giving whatever you can from whatever you have. Right? A year prior to writing this letter, Paul had uh, sat with the Corinthians and had told them about a situation in Jerusalem where the Jewish Jerusalem-based followers of Jesus were suffering because of a drought. There was a famine in that particular part of the world and they were struggling. And so the Corinthian believers said, well, we got a great idea. Why don't we gather some money and, and put some supplies together and we can send it up and we can alleviate their burden. And uh, Paul says a year later, that was a great idea. That was a good idea. It was a godly idea. But we're a year into this and you still haven't done anything about it. You started with such great enthusiasm, you need to rekindle that passion and that enthusiasm and you need to get this thing done because it's going to be good for you and it's going to be good for them. And so when it comes to these unfulfilled commitments, it is good for your soul, it is good for your relationships when you follow through on them because those who are counting on you are going to be helped and are going to be encouraged. So that is the first type of unfinished business, unfulfilled commitments. And I have no, dear, no, no doubt whatsoever that you're probably sitting there thinking to yourself right now, yeah, you know what? I really do need to call my mom, right? Or I really do need to get that payment made, or I do need to get that tax return completed, or I do need to get onto that leaking pipe right before my wife hears this message. All right. Then the second area of unfinished business usually takes the form of unresolved conflicts. Unresolved conflicts. And you see, the nature of conflict is, is this, that the conflicts we sometimes experience in life could be relational. They could be interpersonal in the sense that you might have experienced a relational breakdown in a friendship or a partnership, but they also can be internal and emotional. Because sometimes you come across a situation that you think is unfair or unjust and you feel compelled to say something or to do something to kind of raise a red flag or blow the whistle or speak up in defense of someone or for something. But at the same time, you're conscious of the potential consequence and so you feel internally conflicted. You know what you ought to do, but you're not sure if you want to do it. And so you find yourself wrestling with this internal emotional tension. Truth of the matter is whether the conflict is interpersonal or relational or internal and emotional, 
That type of conflict in order to be resolved requires conversation. You're going to have to speak up. You're going to have to speak out. You're going to have to be willing to step into the vulnerability and the risk that comes with that type of conversation. And you're going to have to be willing to say something, to say something. You know, a while back I uh, met a man who came to see me for some advice and some counsel concerning a relationship in his life. And he had not spoken to his son for 13 years. He and his son were in a business together, kind of went pear-shaped, and uh, they ended up separating. And for 13 years, they had not spoken to each other. Now, they live in the same city. They have one another's contact details. They know where one another lives. But for 13 years, neither of them had the courage or the humility to pick up the phone, to make the call, to reach out, and to try to reconcile. And I said to him, mate, at some point, Somebody is going to have to be willing to take the risk. One of you has got to be willing to pick up the phone and make the call and say, I'm sorry. So take the initiative and do it. And to his credit, he did. He ended up calling his son. He reached out to him. He said, I'm sorry. They ended up reconciling and their relationship was restored. And together they're good. But 13 years. 13 years of isolation and separation, 13 years of pain and suffering, 13 years of wondering what might have been, 13 years of wasted time because neither of them was willing to take the first step to embrace the risk, to say, I'm sorry, can we reconcile? And I know we don't want to have those conversations because they are so confronting and they're so difficult. I know that they're hard, but those conversations need to happen. Whether you're attempting to reconcile a relationship or raise a concern, you have to be willing to step into the conversation. And you know, Jesus had something really important to say about this over in Matthew chapter 5. In his great Sermon on the Mount, in verse 23 to 24 of Matthew 5, this is Jesus speaking. He said, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, Leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. I love this because Jesus is highlighting here that when you come back into right and restored relationship with God, it is going to lead you into right and restored relationship with others. In other words, there is not only a, a vertical kind of relational dimension to the life of faith, there's a horizontal dimension as well. And God doesn't just care about the quality of our relationship with Him. He also cares about the quality of our relationship with everybody else in our world. It matters deeply to Him. And so Jesus is saying, listen, if, you, if you're in church, if you're engaged in worship and serving God, and suddenly you're reminded of the fact that there is someone who has something against you, there's some unresolved conflict in your life, He says, just set your worship aside for a moment and go to that person and do everything in your power to be reconciled. Why? Because God cares deeply about the quality of your relationships. I remember a while back, uh, my wife and I were having, what do I call, a, a heated exchange of ideas. Not a fight, just a heated exchange of ideas. And it was one of those situations that played out over multiple days. Right? Married couples, you'll understand this. And in fact, even if you're not married, you'll understand this. If you have family members or friends and you've ever been in a conflict of any kind, you know what it feels like to be kind of stuck in that ongoing, unresolved uh, tension where, where you're not seeing eye to eye, you're not agreeing, and you can't find resolution, and so you just exist. You coexist in this really tense space. And you know what it's like? You, you get into bed, and uh, you lie on your side of the bed and face the wall, and she lies on the other side of the bed and faces the wall, and you, know, you don't turn and face each other in the night. You just hold your position, because if you turn and face each other, that's like conceding defeat, right? <laughs> okay. And of course, you never let your feet touch, can't let your feet touch, because that's also like like conceding ground, right? And so you just exist in this weird tension. So my wife and I were in this space and we were not seeing eye to eye. And I remember it was a Saturday night and I was preparing to preach and it just wasn't going well. Like it wasn't flowing. I couldn't get my thoughts together. And I remember the Holy Spirit speaking so clearly to my heart and He says, you need to go to your wife and you need to reconcile. You need to ask for forgiveness and you need to restore this relationship because I'm not going to let you preach like this. There's going to be no grace. There's going to be no blessing for this. You need to go and repent and you need to reconcile with your wife. And I thought, oh, 
That's so annoying, right? Don't you hate it when God sides with your spouse, right? It's so annoying. I said to him, God, have you been watching this conversation? Are you aware of what she has done? But I knew he was right because he always is. And so I said, all right, I know this is what I need to do. So I went to her and I said, my darling, I'm so sorry. Um, I owe you an apology for what's been going on, for the way I've been speaking to you, for the way I've been treating you, for the way this has gone for the last few days. And she looked at me and said, uh, you're just saying that because you have to preach tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And I think she was like as reluctant to forgive me as I was to, you know, repent. But fortunately we did. We did because it's really hard to withhold repentance and it's hard to withhold forgiveness when you're both standing in the presence of God. And so we did. And you know, very often when you do, when you take the initiative, when you make the first step, when you reach out, even though your heart might not fully be in the right place, very often your feelings follow. You made the right decision in the right direction and your emotions will catch up. And so we reconciled and thank God I was able to preach with a free and clear conscience, right? And I know, I know like relationship is a two-way street. I get that it takes two to tango. And so if there's going to be a restoration in a relationship, you've got to have two willing parties, but you still have to do whatever you can do to restore and reconcile that relationship, whatever's within your power and capacity. That's why Paul, again, our spiritual dad says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. You might extend repentance, but if they don't offer forgiveness, there's nothing you can do about that. You might reach out in reconciliation and they may not reciprocate. You can't do anything about that either. Whatever you can do, you must do. So take the first step. Send the email. Make the call. Take the initiative. Reach out. Embrace the risk. Say yes to the vulnerability and do whatever you can to resolve the conflict. So unresolved conflict is the second area of unfinished business in our lives. And then thirdly, the third way in which unfinished business shows up for all of us is in the form of what I call unanswered calls. Unanswered calls. And by this, I don't mean the people who are trying to get hold of you on your phone. I'm talking here about the call of God, right? The mandates, the commissions, the tasks, the assignments that are given to us by God. You see, the commitments we make are very often our initiative. They're the commitments we make of our own volition as a result of the choices and the decisions we make. In other words, they are our initiative. But calling refers to God's initiative. Your calling is that which God would have you do. The heavenly vision, the, the divine assignment, the God-given mandate that He has placed upon your life. And so you might be sitting here today, and it's possible that God has been speaking to you, and maybe for some time now, and maybe He's been saying to you, you need to step out and start a not-for-profit organization in order to address some particular issue of social justice in the world or in our city. Maybe God has been talking to you for some time about starting to write. Maybe you know you need to write a book. Maybe you know you need to start blogging and take the ideas that God has been forming in your mind and put it out there in the world for others to read. Maybe for some of you, God's been telling you that it's time to take the songs that you've been writing in your room and singing to yourself in the shower and to start recording them and releasing them so others can hear them. Maybe God's been telling you you need to start sharing your faith with your family, or maybe become more bold and confident in sharing your faith with your friends at work. Maybe God's asking you to give something that you're still holding on to. Maybe God's asking you to take the gift of your time and your talent and your energy and use it to serve other people by volunteering out in the community or even here at church. And I wonder this morning, what is it that God is asking you to do? What assignment has He put in your heart? What mandate has He placed upon your life? And are you willing to say yes to that mandate? I love the way Paul exemplified this in his own life and the way he expresses it here in Acts 20, verse 24. He says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. What a wonderful statement. Paul's saying, I wanna take all that I have, all that I am, all my energy, all my time, all the grace that God has given me. And I want to use it to finish the work that God gave me to do. 
to finish my divine assignment. And the reason why that is so important is because we honour and glorify God when we finish the work He gave us to do. Listen to what Jesus says in John 17, verse 1 to 4. This is just literally hours before He is arrested and taken away to be prosecuted and crucified. And He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane with His disciples. And it says, After Jesus said this, He looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted Him authority over all people, that He might give eternal life to those you have given Him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Wow. I love that. Jesus is saying, hey, this is how we glorify the Father. We glorify Him and we honour Him by finishing the work that He gave us to do. And I wonder what that might be for you today. So altogether, unfulfilled commitments, unresolved conflicts and unanswered calls constitute the unfinished business of our lives. And I wonder where the Holy Spirit might be challenging you or calling you today to respond to the unfinished business in your life. And of course, we couldn't talk about the unfinished business of our lives without referencing the other side of the coin and the other side of this conversation. And that is the unfinished work of God in us. Because you see, on the one hand, There are the things that we ought to do, that only we can do, that still need to be done. But then there is also the kind of people we need to become that we really could never become without the grace and the goodness and the power of God's transforming presence in our lives. In other words, there's an aspect to the unfinished nature of our lives that has to do with what God is doing and what only God can do. And Paul references us so beautifully, and we'll finish with this thought in Philippians 1 verse 6, when he says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. And whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain, right? I'm fully persuaded. I am convinced that God who began the good work in you will continue His work until it is finished on the day when Christ returns. What a powerful statement, right? God who began a good work in you will finish it. He has committed Himself by covenant to completing the good work that He has started in you and that He has started in me. In other words, our God is a finisher. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says that He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Right When Jesus hung up on the cross of Calvary, giving His life for you and for me, with His very last breath, He cried out these words, It is finished. The work of God's redemption And salvation, His intervention into our human story, finished. Because our God is a finisher. And it doesn't matter if you've been following Him for 10 years or one year or one month. God has started a work in you. And He is going to bring it to completion. In fact, you might not even consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus here today. You might have got dragged along because it was Father's Day. You might be here under duress. You might just be at the front end of exploring this Christian faith. But I guarantee you, God is already at work in your life. He's already doing things that you might not even be aware of yet. And that same God who started that work will be faithful to complete it. So don't give up on you. Don't give up on your life. Don't give up on your faith. Don't give up on the call of God on your life just because it's hard now. Because God has not given up on you. God will never give up on you. And He is going to see the good work that He has started in you through to completion. Amen. 